Well, good day. It's the 22nd day of June already, 2021. Very rainy and cooler here in Stafford. Hope it's nice where you're at. Uh, my aim on this channel, not just to tell you which jobs are open, not just to tell you the application procedures and how to get those jobs, but, but also to give you a realistic impression, realistic uh, means of evaluating whether a job is for you or not. And that's what I aim to do with this particular uh, segment. I'm going to talk about something that um, you've probably heard this phrase before, collateral damage. What in the heck is that? Was well, unintended damage. Uh, damage sometimes to innocent people in this case, innocent uh, people who get hurt uh, through no fault of their own. Happens a lot in wartime, okay? But it does also happen in drug law enforcement. And this is a story about how a small town in Mexico the town of Allende in the state of Coahuila was destroyed as a result of a DEA operation. It was destroyed by the narcotics traffickers in retaliation. Well, it's been said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and I believe that. And until the early 1990s, the town of Allende, which is about 40 miles south of the Rio Grande, was a beautiful place, it was a place anyone would love to visit. I'd like to go down there even just for a day trip. I mean, and there would be restaurants, uh, you know, hotels, just a, a beautiful place to visit. And how did this little paradise become the site of a ma massacre? And that's the topic of this video. You know, how did it happen? Well, of course, you know, you probably know that Mexico has been a location, uh, a folk focal point for drug smuggling for quite some time, many years now, and especially a, a town that's only 40 miles from the border. You know, it's going to be uh, a place where a lot of drug trafficking takes place. And up through the 60s, 70s, 80s, Allende was a point where different drug traffickers would uh, smuggle marijuana into the United States. But in the early 1990s, the cocaine cartels in Colombia changed their M.O., instead of smuggling drugs into the United States through South Florida, which they had done before by boat and by air, they decided to change their method of operation and to use the Mexican border uh, because the Mexican police are known for, well, corruption. And this would ensure the safety of their loads, at least to the Mexican border. And with the amount of cross-border traffic, it made sense for them. Now, concurrent with this decision rose several trafficking groups that became involved in control of turf, of areas. They became known as cartels in and of themselves. And one of the most famous, uh, and one of the most infamous, I should say, the Zetas Cartel, the Los Zetas Cartel. And it is uh, an organization that was uh, comprised largely initially of military and police deserters. And many had been trained by the US military, many had been trained by DEA, but starting in the mid 1990s, they decided they would leave their posts, sometimes with their weapons, and that they could get more money working for local drug traffickers. And one of the ways that they could ensure that they were hired was by being particularly brutal. And they were known as the Zs, the Zetas, and, you know, they became notoriously regarded as one of Mexico's most dangerous syndicates. And they were known for engaging in brutally violent shock and awe tactics. This poor guy is about to get murdered on the screen. Um, and these included beheadings, torture, setting people on fire, indiscriminate murder. And while primarily concerned with drug trafficking, they were also involved in sex trafficking, gun running, from the United States to Mexico, protection rackets, assassinations, extortions, and now undoubtedly human trafficking, you know, smuggling undocumented uh, immigrants across the United States. And it was based in Nuevo Laredo, New Laredo, across the river from the, the city of Laredo. And again, it started with commandos of the Mexican army, but they grew in power until the year about 2010, in which they had become so powerful that they were able to break away from really the Colombians and from the other cartels. They formed their own organization. 
in which they were really responsible from A to Z, from procuring cocaine in Colombia to getting it to Mexico to getting it to their own distribution cells in the United States, and not just cocaine, but also fentanyl. Well, concurrent with the rise of this Zetas cartel, around 2009, uh, a vehicle was stopped, just a random vehicle stop, and in the trunk is uh, about $850,000. And the driver, of course, knows who the owner of the money is. He can describe him, but he only knows him as El Diablo. And as they start looking at cell phones and other things, they notice some commonality and an investigation is started. And eventually El Diablo is identified as a man named Jose Vasquez. And he is a native of the town of Allende. He started, came to the US as a child, started selling drugs in high school, and was now a leading Zetas distributor for cocaine in East Texas and really throughout the United States, moving truckloads of drugs, guns, and money. Well, the investigation proceeds, they're ready to take it down, but providentially for Mr. Uh, Vasquez, or not so providentially, the day that the warrants are served, he happens to be in Allende. So the DEA enters the house to serve the warrants, they begin rounding up his henchmen, but Vasquez is out of town. While the DEA is inside Vasquez's house, uh, a phone call is made to Vasquez and they tell him his wife is being locked up, he doesn't really care. But when they tell him his mother's going to be prosecuted, because she's dirty on the phone as well, she's talked and she's locked up or prosecutable as a co-conspirator, that's a bridge too far. And he offers to come to the U.S., plead guilty to everything and uh, get a life sentence, no good. He's got to come to the U.S., give a complete statement, and they want, to, want him to do a little thing for them. And this is called playing hardball. This is something that you do in drug law enforcement. And what they want him to do, what the prosecutor and the case agent want him to do, is to provide information on the Trevino brothers, who are key members of the Zetas cartel. And specifically, they want the uh, identifying numbers. It's called the IMEI or the ESN on the cell phones used by Omar and Miguel Trevino, who head the Las Zetas cartel. And they know they can get this information. And of course, Vasquez doesn't want to do it. He's afraid to do it, but he doesn't want his mother to go to jail. He doesn't want his wife to go to jail. And um, so he agrees to do this. And he knows the Trevino's right-hand man, uh, the guy who gets their phones for them, because his brother's in trouble as well. His brother's been locked up, so he has a reason to cooperate. So they figure they're gonna get this number, and what can go wrong? Nothing, right? Well, once the DEA got the number, there's a couple of things they could have done. Uh, we could have monitored their phones. Uh, that's doable. But what they decided to do, it was made in DEA headquarters, was pass the information to our Mexican counterparts. And DEA has a number of what they call sensitive investigative units. These are squads of foreign police or military who receive additional pay from the DEA or <coughs> other agencies. And they're vetted every six months by polygraph and urinalysis. They're trained in the U.S. And the hope is that nations in which corruption is endemic, such as Mexico, they can be trusted with sensitive information and work with us. And they're, they've been a smashing success in Thailand and in Colombia. But in Mexico and Afghanistan, not so much. Well, what DEA does then is they provide this information. Uh, they decide to go with uh, informing our counterparts in Mexico, and they provide the information to the Mexican SIU. And what happens next is horrible. Within about an hour of notifying the Mexican SIU, the Trevinos are tipped off. Uh, they make a phone call to Vasquez. They want to talk to him. They drop their phones. The case agent tells Vasquez, get across the river to the U.S. Your, your life is in danger. But the Trevinos are ticked off. I mean, they're pissed. And what they do is they go to his hometown, Allende, to look for him and also to punish anyone uh, who would come from such a town. And they decide to punish the entire town. And they order the massacre of people largely indiscriminate. And up to 300 people may have been killed that night, uh, on the night of March 18, 2011. The town was destroyed in a manner reminiscent of Genghis Khan. This is some of the rubble that is left. This monument stands in the center of this beautiful town, once beautiful town. 
It was erected in 2015 in memory of the victims of the uh, Trevino brothers and uh, stands as a stark warning, you know, what can go wrong. Sometimes even with the best of intentions, things can go wrong. The Trevino brothers themselves were arrested. Both Miguel and Omar were arrested by Mexican Marines and they're serving time, but it really doesn't matter because a new cartel and new traffickers have arisen. And most recently, you know, despite the takedown of cartel members, the new president of Mexico, this happened just a few months ago, the Mexican government tried to arrest Ovito Guzman, the son of El Chapo, and he sent his gunmen into the streets and the president ordered Ovito released, which shows who's in charge in Mexico. Some stories have a happy ending and some do not. In this one, it's fortunate that the Trevinos were eventually arrested and imprisoned. What is amazing is that Special Agent Martinez did all of this work while battling kidney cancer. And I'm sorry to say that he passed from that disease in November of 2019. I think to the day he died, though, he regretted doing this case. Operation Too Legit to Quit. He was named Agent of the Year in 2011, but he regretted it because of what happened in Allende. And it was not Agent Martinez's fault. It's not DEA's fault. It's the corrupt Mexican police. It is the corrupt drug cartels, uh, organizations that have no place in a civilized society. And um, the work of Agent Martinez, the work of the DEA, the work of those who want to enter drug law enforcement, um, his example, you know, has to be an example to us all, you know, and we can't quit because if we do, the Trevinos and people like them will end up in charge. Thank you for watching.